Hello, today is December 12th, 2001. My name is Matthew Nethercott, and I'm going to be interviewing Mr. Edmund Weed. Running the camera will be Patrick Mangino. The interview time is 11 o'clock this Wednesday morning. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. You're welcome. I'm very glad to be here. Um, I'd like to start off with where and when you were born, if that's all right. Sure. I was born <coughs> July 3rd, 1925, in, Ro in Norwich, New York. I know where that is. Do you? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's not that far from Binghamton. No, it's 40 miles. 40 miles. Okay. Oh. What did you do as a uh, child for entertainment? Well, actually, I was nuts about sports, and I, I continued right through my whole life. When I was in high school, I played uh, football. I was on a wrestling team, and I also was involved in baseball. We had a lot of fun in, in Norwich. It was, a, I think, one of the best places in the world to grow up as a kid. And uh, I lived about two, two and a half miles out of town, and the only time I had a ride to school in the morning was with my mother in the wintertime. I rode my bike or took, took my feet and walked in, but we didn't make it in every day. Back then, the boys had to wear, didn't have to, but we wore shirts and ties and pants, and we always got a bunch of ties for Christmas, so you start out the new year with a new tie, and the girls wear dresses and skirts. And I remember one time we had one of our football players decided when this girl came into school wearing slacks, that he was going to come to school with a dress. <laughs> and he came in with a dress and he got bounced, but the girl didn't get thrown out. So it was a different, different era, different than you folks are familiar with, I'll, I'll guarantee you. When did you graduate from high school? I graduated in, in the June of 1942, and I was 16 years old. And I, actually, I turned 17 the next month, but I say I was 16 when I graduated. Did you get drafted or enlisted? No, I enlisted. Uh, December 7th, 1941 was on a Sunday and the next day in school about 15 of us senior classmen were went into the office and were going to quit school. We we're going to go out and win a war. We just uh, we couldn't take that stuff. Well, fortunately, we had a fantastic guidance counselor who says, go back to your home, your study hall, your room. It was in the study hall. They'll take you when they need you. Get your degree if you can. And I did. I got graduated. And, uh, and during the summer, I worked as a lifeguard at a pool and started school as a post-grad school, uh, post-graduate. And I took uh, courses and played football for my last time. And then I had a big group going in the Navy. And one of my buddies said, come on, Ed, let's go. So I had to have my mother and father okay it. Mind you, I'm only 17. And uh, I went home and told my mom I wanted to go in the Navy. And she said, well, we knew you were going to have to go sometime. If the Navy is what you want, we'll let you. We'll sign and I went in the Navy. So I went on the Friday the 13th, uh, November 13th, 1942. Um, what? I'm sorry. Right, um, where did you train? All right, I had boot camp at Samson, Air, Samson Naval Base in, in Geneva Lake. And that, that went through Christmas, spent the first Christmas in the service at, in boot camp. And I went from there to Memphis, Tennessee, to Aviation Machinist Made School. And then we, they sent us to Gunnery School over on the East Coast in, in Maryland. And that was aviation gunnery practice, firing 50 calories and, uh, into targets and stuff. And from there I joined the squadron and, and from there I flew in uh, PBM Martin Mariners for the rest of my time in the service. Um, what is a PBM? A PBM Martin Mariner, and I have a picture here for you if you want to see it. I kind of explain it's a pretty good sized plane. We had a crew of about eight and uh, twin engine seaplane that landed on the water and took off on the water. And if you wanted to bring it in for uh, maintenance, you had to hook wheels on it to, to pull it up, up the ramp. Otherwise, it stayed out in the bay all the time. 
and uh, it was a very slow plane. Uh, I think we could get maybe 350 knots out of the thing if we were falling straight down. But other than that, it was about 200, 250 knots. It was about top speed. And we did a lot of anti-submarine patrolling and convoy coverages and that sort of thing. Cool. Um, when you were in basic training or boot camp, as you called it, what was it like? Uh, to me, it was fun. <laughs> to a lot of guys, it was, it was work and, and drudgery. Uh, you got up at a certain time, you slept in a, in a big barracks with a bunch of guys that snored all night long, and uh, you had you, you took big hikes and you, you learned how to salute. I never forget one fellow in our group the first day he saluted with his left hand. And the, guy, <laughs> the guy that was leading us, he, he was a little upset. But uh, actually, uh, boot camp was uh, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, it was a big pool and we did a lot of swimming. And they had a cargo net which you used to climb up on the top and get on top of the board and jump in, and that to me was a lot of fun. And all of a sudden, one day, the guy who was in charge of the pool with his bamboo pole, he called me over to the side. He says, hey, you get up here with us. I thought, hey, I did. what the heck did I do wrong? He says, here, you take this pole and you watch those guys. You don't need this swimming place. Because we had a lot of southern boys in there that couldn't swim. And it was really death and life effect for them. But me, I was on a ball. <laughs> Mind you, understand one thing. I went into 17 and I came out when I was 21. I, I, I grew up in the Navy. I became a man in the Navy. I was a, a kid going in, no question about it. Um, did you have any time off after your boot camp experience? Before no. Oh, you... yes, I did. I had, I had one week uh, leave, one week leave, and then I went to Memphis, Tennessee. And that was the first leave, and I had one more after that, and that was all I had the whole time I was in the service. Did you ever get to see your parents again before you went over to the Pacific? No. No, I flew right straight from uh, Quonset Point to uh, San Diego, and from San Diego to the Hawaiian Islands, and from Hawaii Islands to the Anahuatec, and, and I stayed there. And uh, we flew uh, looking for submarines and we covered a, a strike on Wake Island, which is one of the islands they bypass. They didn't take all the islands, they bypassed some of the islands. And uh, I have a picture of me on that, with that tank, that Japanese tank. Uh, uh, from there, we had orders that we were going to fly to the China coast. And we were going to fly Dumbo, which means that we were going to land and take off to pick up uh, down pilots that were getting ready for the invasion of Japan. And God bless Harry, he dropped the bomb and wound up the whole thing and I didn't have to go there because they only had the Japs pushed back about 90 miles from the coast and it was going to be kind of close, <laughs> too close for me anyway. you got to remember, I'm, I'm doing this all from memory because I haven't thought about this in years. Um. What was your, did you ever experience actual combat? Only once at, uh, at Wake Island, we were, we, the pilot I had was a kind of a hot shot, and he wanted to go in and see what the Navy had done with their bombs, and we got a little too close, and they started shooting at us, and we got the hell out of there. <laughs> <laughs> you can try to think of that airplane I'm going to show you here as a, a fighter plane. You'll know you can't do things with that. That's, like I said, it was a pretty slow, pretty slow crate. Um, when you flew Dumbo, were you shot at a lot? No. Uh, when we flew Dumbo, we, we never got out that, that far out there. We would have been shot at if we got up close to them. We didn't, if, we, if, if we hadn't had the, the atom bomb drop, we would have been out there and been shot at for sure. And landing in the, in the ocean is no fun. I landed once in the ocean and it really was an experience. We were covering convoys coming out of Boston and New York going to Europe. And we were flying out from Quonset Point. And this plane that I'm talking about had gas tanks in the hull. And you had to bring the gas from the hull up into the wing tanks. And you had two little switches from each, for each engine. And this one guy in our crew took a matchbook and put it between the warning lights and the switches so they were on down constantly. And he filled one tank up so full that it went out the vent and was 
uh, yeah, I don't think you've ever seen a radial engine, but they spark like crazy. And we could have been blown right out of the air. So they shut the engine down and landed in the middle Atlantic with one engine. And we opened the bomb base and aired the thing out. And, and uh, we were pulling around out there. And I, like I said, I was too young to think about being scared because I, mean, I was having a good time bouncing around on the swells out there. Anyway, to make a long story short, we decided, okay, it's ready to take off and we can go back now. So here we are getting ready to take off, and you take off into the wind. And the pilot said, the co-pilot said to the pilot, hey, let's get out of here, because if that convoy sees us on the water, they'll think they went out of their minds. So we started to take off, and every time we'd take off, we'd hit a swell, and slow us right down, so we couldn't get off. So we took off uh, crosswind, and the plane was rocking back and forth like this. And finally we got airborne and got out of there and got home. And it wasn't until I got back home I realized what a harrowing experience that was. Um, what islands did you go to, or were you stationed at? I was on Kwasla and Anawitak and Majuro. And these islands were all shot to pieces. There wasn't a tree standing there. Everything was down. It was the one that, when they went through and took these islands, they, they did a ter terrific job of cleaning them off. Cause they were, and there was people living on those islands out there. And we talk, I think, is no more. I think they dropped an atom bomb on that one or blew it up, and I think that's gone. Yeah. What were your feelings about the atom bomb? Well, to be honest with you, I, was, I, I think it was the greatest thing that happened to me because I'm alive to tell you about this story. And if, I, if, if he hadn't dropped the atom bomb, I think I might have been no longer. I think I would have been gone. I don't think I'd have come back from China. And that's been my honest opinion. I've told that enough people, but... That's how I feel. I, I, I think, God bless Harry, that's all I got to say. You got to remember about that atom bomb. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks about how bad it was on the Japanese, but they never stop and realize how many Japanese lives were saved because the war ended. If they had gone in, that would have been a life and death struggle on that island and on Japan. And there would have been a lot more Japanese people killed than there were from dumping that one atom bomb. But people never think about that. And also the, America, the American lives that were saved. People don't even think about that either. Because the war ended right there on that day. And uh, all everybody says, oh, how terrible that is. How could we possibly do it? Well, they did some pretty terrible things to us too. But they don't bring those things up when they start talking about the atom bomb. <laughs> don't get me started on that one. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, I never thought of that. No, man, not many right. people do. So you're not alone, believe me. Um, after the war ended, uh, how, did you stay into the service longer or were you discharged? No, the minute I got my points, I got my plane back to the island where we were stationed at. I was on a forward base. And I got back to that one and I was hoping the plane was going to hang up because I had my points. I was on my way home. And I got aboard ship, and I came back into San Diego and took a train across country and got out of, was discharged out of Long Island, and I didn't even want to join the Boy Scouts after that. No, I'd had enough of that for a while. What I really wanted to do was go to college. And because of my service time, I was able to go to college and get two degrees, my bachelor's and my master's. So I, I came out of a pretty, pretty good shape. Uh, what, what are the points that you're talking about? Uh, when the war ended, uh, you had to have so many points, it was based on your time in service, your time overseas, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure what else they had, but you had to get, I think, 75 points, something like that, and when you had enough time in, they uh, sent you home, told you to go. They, they, they let them out in groups so they wouldn't all swamp out at once, and I was one of the earlier groups of my squadron. What was normal life, uh, if you could call it that, when you were over in the Pacific? Well, the normal life is you would get up to probably around 6 o'clock and you would have uh, an exercise program, which is some one of the group would lead calisthenics outside your tent, and you'd get cleaned up and you'd go to breakfast, and then you'd go to work, whatever your work happened to be. In my case, it was with planes. If there was anything that had to be done on the planes, you did it, if you, if you were able to do it. If uh, you didn't uh, have that and you had to fly, 
for example, we flew from Nicaragua to Galapagos Islands, and a lot of those ops were 18 hours, 15 hours, 13 hours. You fly down one day and back the next, and you do that about five, six days in a row without without a break, time off. Because we had uh, what we had, we had a 12-plane squadron, and we had eight planes in the air every day. So we only had two that could be down in Anahuac, or on, not Anahuac, on uh, Galapagos or Nicaragua. Only two on each end, because we only had a 12-plane squadron. When you were a mechanic, what were some of the common problems that you found with the planes? Well, the Navy divided the mechanics up into two groups. One worked on the planes, mm -hmm. the ones that were down, and stayed on the islands. What I did, I was on the plane that flew, and if you'll see me here in this one picture I got of me on the panel, we had charge of all the engine gauges and uh, uh, the gas and the gas tank transferring gas and things like that. There was another group on a plane, they were radio men. Two guys were just, that's all they did was work on the radar and radio. Uh, we had two, we had one bombardier, we had a head pilot, co pilot, and, and navigator. And uh, my job was uh, actually flying, and I had, I had a gun job that was, I was in the tail gun all the way back in the tail of the plane. You couldn't see where you're going, but you could sure see where you've been. And we, we had twin 50s back there, I know. The ball turret that you that you could sit in. When you're back there, do you uh, sit or lay on your stomach? No, you sit. You sit and work the handles with yourself and turn it around. And, but you sit. No, you don't lay. Not, not in this plane. We had a turret in the back. We had a turret in the front. And we had twin fifties in the uh, sides, out the sides of the plane, uh, in the after station, and that's. All the armament we had on board plane, except the death charges. Were the tail guns to protect you from any enemies coming up behind you? Yeah. And strafing when you got a chance. If you if you need to strafe, you could be the last guy to be shooting at him. Was but, oh sorry. Well, we didn't have any of those opportunities. Yeah. When we were out there, we we didn't see any subs. We saw a lot of school uh, big schools of fish, but the other day we didn't see any. But there again, no sub got in and did any damage to the Panama Canal either. And I don't know if I told you that, but we were flying. I went to Panama, and Panama, our outside base was in Nicaragua, Managua, Nicaragua. And we flew back and forth between Galapagos Islands and, and Nicaragua. And there was another plane in Ecuador, Ecuador did another squadron in Ecuador that did the same thing. So we were flying a V for the canal. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Did I get that all right? Yes. <laughs> all right. Uh, what does strafing mean? Strafing? Yes. Uh, strafing is when you, an airplane shoots at anything on the ground. Wow. You've seen pictures on TV of these fighter planes with the guns in the wings shooting out when they're coming out. Mm -hmm. That's strafing. Okay. Were you given uh, sidearms or a specific gun to carry? We had a 38. Shoulder holster 38. Um, yeah. Did you receive any medals when you were. You mean uh, Purple Heart or thing like that? Uh, yes. No, I don't. I got, all I got was uh, that once where they. Uh, where we were at, I had uh, what? American Campaign Medal, American Theater Campaign, uh, Asia Pacific Campaign, and Good Conduct. That's, that's all I received. That's the only ribbons I was allowed to wear. What rank did you hold? Pardon me? What rank did you hold? Aviation Machinist made second class, was as far as I went. You realize you're talking to a white hat now, not, a, not an officer. I was not an officer. Okay. Was there any uh, point in time when you're in your service that you really didn't want to be there anymore before you were? Uh, Every Christmas day, I was probably more depressed on Christmas day than any other time. Other than that, no.
Christmas was the time I wanted to be home, home with my family, and I couldn't. And in those days, I, was, I remember almost every Christmas I get up by myself and just let the world go by. Because there wasn't much doing, and, uh, and I think most guys missed home more on Christmas than any other time. How did you feel life was like once you got back to the United States after the war? Well, when I got back to the United States and got home, uh, naturally the next thing I had to do was find a job. And uh, at, at that time they were giving uh, what they call 5220. They had a year's uh, eligibility of receiving $20 a week of unemployment. And I signed up for it and I got two checks before I got a job. I found a job working in a fish line factory in my hometown of Norwich and for 50 cents an hour. I think, I mean, I think maybe it was 90 cents an hour. And we worked, uh, quite, we worked quite long hours. We worked 50 hours a week, 10 hours a day, five days a week. And then uh, my next job was to find clothes because all I had was <laughs> my GIs. And, uh, but it was good. I, I came back and I had a good time. I was only in my hometown for about a, well, from when I get out, I got out in January and I went to college the following fall. So I enjoyed being home. I had a good time. I, I couldn't complain. <laughs> Did you feel that feel the Navy had prepared you for the long 10 hour days working the yeah, fish factory? Because you put a lot of 10 hour days in the Navy too. Sure. Yeah, no, I had no, of course I was, I was a lot younger than I am now, so 10 hour day wasn't that bad. No, it was okay. What college did you go to? I went to Ithaca College. And where did you get your bachelor? I got my bachelor's degree in uh, June of 1949. And I tried to get a job, and there was no jobs available because was, everybody was graduating. Back then, was, all the GIs were graduating. So I went back to Ithaca College and got my master's degree. And when I got, I graduated with my master's in 50, and I got a job in South Otsilic. You know where that is? No. It's about 10, 12 miles the other side of Norwich for $2,400 a year. And I just want to get my foot in the door. I tell you, it was a, a lean year for my wife and myself, but we made it. And I got a letter from, uh, I didn't get a letter, I got a telephone call from Lyndon Strau, who was a superintendent of schools here in Rome, asking me if I'd be interested in a job in Rome. And I said, yeah, what would the, what's, what would the salary be in a rough range? And it was going to be around 37, 3,500. And that sounded pretty good from 24. So I said, yeah, can I come and visit? And I came and... I was picked up by Charlie Dane, who was director of athletics, and I uh, stayed here the rest of my career. And I retired in 1982. I don't know if that's anything you're interested in. If you had to go back and do the war all over again, would you? If I had to go back, I'd go all the way back to my fifth grade and go all the way through the whole thing again. I, I enjoyed every minute of it. Yeah, I, I had a good time in the service. I had a wonderful time in high school. And uh, no, I'd do it all over again if I could. Absolutely. Anybody says they wouldn't be crazy, I think. It's the best time of your life. When you're in the Navy, was there something that you really wanted to do that you never really got the chance to? I can't think of anything right offhand. I got a chance to fly when I'd never flown a, a second before. And uh, I met a lot of great guys. And a lot of great girls, too. I don't know about you young guys, but we went to church to find girls. So that's what we did. We found girls in church and they'd take us home for lunch and then we'd start dating and it would be great. Yeah. Maybe life was not bad.
I'm not trying to recruit you guys. <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to add about the islands that maybe I overlooked? Because I'm not very familiar with the Pacific. I'm sure you're not. I, I, we had one interesting thing happen on in, in, in Anahuitac. I think it might be interesting. So I told you the planes landed on the water and they hooked up to a buoy and they stayed in the water. And if you wanted to change them around, you could send a, a minor crew out, a pilot, a fellow in the after station, and somebody in the front with a hook to catch the buoy. About three guys. And in the tail of this plane, there was a manhole. The, the air, the air, the very part of the plane out. And out there is hotter, bloody hell anyway. Anyway, um, we the plane was out there with a the manhole open. But the guy in the after station, when he got the question from the pilot, everything all secure? He said, all secure. And they took off, and as you push the throttles forward, the tail goes down. And that manhole is still open. And it starts to fill up with water. And the guy came running out up there and up on the bridge, and he says, we're sinking. And sure as heck, the water was coming right behind him. And they sank the plane right in the bay out to the wings. The wings kept it up. And they took the plane out after about a week and took it out in the, the ocean and put, cut holes in the wing and sank it. Never took a thing of it. Never recovered a thing. But I think the funny thing was when they got their new plane, and they, by, by the way, they had to go up in front of the old man, and they got their bus chewed a little bit. They got their bus chewed a lot of it. But anyway, we uh, were kind of kidding with them, said, you're going to paint a PBM Martiner on your plane and take a credit for a down plane? And they didn't think that was funny at all. <laughs> no, we can't think of anything. At the time, I think I'd like to go on the China coast just to have the experience, but I don't think it would have been too much fun. Landing in the China Sea out there had been rough. Uh, ever since you called me, I've been trying to think of what I could tell you, and these are about the things I thought about. Like I said, there have been an awful lot of nice guys. Liberty was fun. I grew up in the Navy. I actually grew up from 17 or 21. I became a man in the Navy. Anything else? Uh, how often did you write your parents? We were required by our officers to write at least once a week. Uh, I did that. Uh, wrote to my sister who was living at home. She would she moved to, to Atlanta. And, uh, it was, it was, you should write home. They're, they're wondering where you are and what you're doing and if you're still okay. And I think one time I didn't. I kind of neglected my parents and I got a package one day from my mother with a bunch of stamps, some envelopes, and some writing paper and I got the hint. <laughs> Actually, I didn't have to have stamps because all you had to do was write up in the corner where a stamp goes. It was during the Navy or something like that, and they, they sent it on for you. You didn't have to pay postage. But it's only three cents back then anyway. Wow. Were you ever stationed aboard a ship? No. I had probably a, <laughs> my Navy career, I spent, I think, what, 17 days aboard ship, and that was both transportation. From one from one dirty place to another. And actually being stationed aboard a ship, I never was. Um, do you have a lot of people from your company get killed or come back missing? No. We never got that close to. Uh, uh, the war zone that uh, we had people get shot down or killed. No. And I'm just happy about that too. Well, pilot, my pilot we had, uh, I'd gone anyways with him. Because I think he knew how to handle a plane and knew how to handle men. And he was a great guy. And I lost track of him, but boy, I'll tell you, he was some pilot. He could fly that plane. When we were getting shot at there awake, 
I think he thought he was flying a P-51 or 47 or something because I was making a fighter plane out of that big bomber and we got out okay. But it was, he was a great guy. No, we didn't have anybody. I had some of my high school people that went in other services that didn't come back. But that, uh, not in squadron. What else? Um, uh, let's see. Did you witness any battles? Like, no. No. When I got to Quasin, Anwitak, Majuro, those battles were all, they'd gone on beyond that area. And we were in the, the squadrons that were catching up out there. And uh, no, I never. Never witness any. I particularly don't want to. But it was fun. I, I enjoyed Navy life, and like I said, I was glad to get out because I did something I, w I wanted to do and made a life career out of it. Um, when you were in the Pacific, did you know what was going on in the European area? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We had radios over there, and we. We could hear what they were going on, and we had a map, and we sort of kept track of what, where they were talking, where the U.S. was, where Russia was, where the Germans were. Oh, yeah. And we knew what was going on in the Pacific also. We knew what, what, what islands it was, they were working at, fighting at, whatnot, where they were attacking. We kept pretty close track of that. It was a big interest in our part. Got anything else? I don't offhand. Um, when you came back to the United States and you got done with college and started teaching, what uh, did students ask if you had been in the war? No, I don't remember anybody specifically saying it because I think most everybody thought at my age they had been, they were. Uh, not any particular reason why they would think that, but uh, most of the young men that were back were, were veterans. Yeah. I might tell you one thing that was interesting for me. Uh, when we came back, I came back aboard ship to San Diego to be discharged, and I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning to, go, to get up on the deck to look up and watch us go underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, because I'd never seen it before. you got to remember, being then how young I was and, and the town I lived in, and that's still about the only place I had been too much, uh, this was an experience of seeing the world, and I did. I saw quite a lot of it. I saw some places that I just soon not see again, some islands that I say that I think God forgot. But uh, it was it was an experience, and I'm <laughs> here to tell you about it. <laughs> um, I know that last Friday was the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Did you do you still have any feelings about uh, what had happened? Like, are you upset about, about the, uh, Pearl Pearl Harbor? Pearl Harbor? Sure. Good God, yes. A lot, of, a lot of good people were killed with a sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, just like it was in New York City. So, I hate like heck to hear these do-getters say that Ben Laden is, you can't do anything to him because he killed people that were working, civilians. And he didn't realize that how bad a thing he was doing, because he admitted that. No, the Japs came into Pearl Harbor. And I know there's a lot of stories about we forced them into it. I don't know anything about that, but it was terrible. I have some friends of mine that were at Pearl Harbor when it, when it happened, and they, they tell you some pretty tough stories about what was going on. Because we were caught shorthanded. We were not prepared. We not, did not expect it. And, uh, no. That was, that was awful. And started a a bloody massacre, a lot of, of our young men. 
you know, I, I have no qualms about saying I don't like Pearl Harbor, didn't think it should happen. Or the trade tower either. I don't think that should happen. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have been in that plane and heading for some place and all of a sudden you're heading for a trade tower or a ramp? I would not want to be there. No, I would not either. I don't think anybody would. I would not want to have been on the hundred and whatever floor above there either. Because those people never got out. I see they just got six out this week. That was awful. It's unbelievable how that could happen. And step there and watch a television and watch a plane come in one side and come out the other. Awful. How are we doing on time? A lot of it. A lot of the time, huh? Mm -hmm. You had about half an hour. Oh dear. <laughs> Do you think it's right that people compare Pearl Harbor to uh, September 11th? What's the difference? What is the difference? You tell me. The, the guy ran the tower down here, and mm -hmm. over there they bombed ships. Uh, doesn't make any difference. They started a war. It's, it, to me, it was identical. Uh, nah. Uh, and people today that say we're not at war, I think they're crazy. They didn't say that when they bombed Pearl Harbor. It was the day of infamy, as Mr. Roosevelt said. It was. They caught us napping, and they caught us good. Have, have you ever been aboard the Arizona? No, I haven't. You want to go aboard it sometime. Take a train. Go to, go to Honolulu. Go to Pearl, Pearl Harbor. And go there and see that ship. It's down there. You can still see the outline of the ship. And you can still see the bubble of the oil coming up that keeps coming out of the tanks, even to this day. And it's been, what, 60 years? Yes. Wow. And they, they're worried about it because they're afraid the sides of the ship are decaying so bad that it's going to cave in and it really put it all slick up. But uh, I was out, to, out there, and, and if you ever get out there, go to the cemetery. That's something to see. The National Cemetery out there. But uh, I was aboard the Arizona one time, in fact, just about uh, two years ago, three years ago. Or a little longer than that, I don't but it was, that was one place I had to see. If I didn't see anything else in the Hawaii Islands, it had to be that. And I did. I made it the second day I was there. I made sure I saw it. And they have a big crowd that goes out there every day. Every single day. You know that the, the Jap who led the squadron came back and, and visited Pearl Harbor? Did you, did you know that? Mm -hmm. They were telling a story out there and how they come back and how he said he wished he'd never done it. So, no, that was a day of infamy, no question about it. And as far as I'm concerned, the World Trade Center is another one. It, it brought the country back together again. It unified the country where it hadn't been for a long time. So, I just hope that this thing ends before we lose any, too many more lives. But they've got to stop it right now. I don't think you can say... Okay, you killed a thousand people, but uh, we forgive you. Don't just don't do it again. I don't think that's the way to look at it. I don't think it can be that way. I think whoever did it, whoever was in charge of it, has got to be caught and taken care of. I don't care whether they do it in federal court or whether they do it in war criminal court or what they do, as long as they do it and, and do what that has to be done. I don't know how you young fellows feel about it, but. If I was you, I'd be glad I lived in Rome instead of in New York City. I am. I would think you'd be very happy to be here. And, uh, but it doesn't mean that something can't happen here. It doesn't mean they can't come up here and poison our water supply or some other thing like that, which is terrorism, and kill every one in the city of Rome. It could happen. We know that now, and we can't protect ourselves from nothing. But we're going to do somehow, we're going to do it. I'd like to know what your opinion is. Wow. Well, about Pearl Harbor now. Pearl Harbor? I don't think it was right that the Japanese did it. And Mr. Ford's been telling us that the Jap uh, Japanese general that was in the United States tried to give us warning, but even if they gave us warning, it still was not right that they did it. So we hadn't done anything to them. Well, uh, no, we hadn't. But we had, we did something to their oil supply. 
but I, I don't quite know the, the question about that, so I'm not going to discuss it. But no, <coughs> to come in and, and bomb somebody on a Sunday morning when he knows everybody's in church or off duty, and uh, I don't know why the early uh, radar points didn't pick it up, but they didn't, and they came in, they had a free hand for quite a while before they, the guys on the ground could get their hands on some guns and start shooting back. And they got a few planes, but uh, the Japs had a chance at put. There's two strikes, come in and drop, and go back and get loaded up and come in again. So, and uh, it was it was bad. But I think Trade Center, the Trade Center, is just as bad. I think I think it was awful. Yeah. After Pearl Harbor, did you see? more people displaying the American flag like they do today. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And every window that had a serviceman in it, had a serviceman's, uh, being a serviceman's mother in the window. I know my mom had one in. And then they had the ones that were gold star. They were the ones that were had lost, got killed. And uh, I think that was the way it was. Anyway, they had two of them. And uh, yeah, there was a lot of patriots in the country really pulled together and the women got in and did men's work and, and these war plants and did a great job, did a fantastic job. Yeah. And I think the country pulled together after the Trade Center incident too. But I'm an old man talking so long. <laughs> I don't know how you young fellows feel. It was horrible, but yeah, and it shouldn't have occurred. No, I don't think so. I just think it was really horrible that they do such a thing. Mm -hmm. And to think that they stole two of our planes and killed all the plenty of people aboard them just to take that out of I think people are a little scared to fly today. I, I don't feel that way. I, I just came back from Nebraska visiting my daughter, and I'm flying out to uh, San Diego in the first week in January. But I'm not going to let that son of a gun scare me off the plane. If he kills me, he kills me, but I'm not going to let him scare me off the plane. It's just, it's just because he said he might do it. Uh, <clears throat> I think you've got to live. You've got to keep on living. You've got to live your life. You can't. You can't let somebody else scare you to the point where you've got to hide all the time. That's not the way to do it. I know when I got off the plane and, and was in the Chicago airport, it was about oh, 6 o'clock in the afternoon, and there was hardly anybody in the Chicago airport, which is always a busy, busy place. O'Hare is a busy airport. And uh, there was hardly anybody in there at 6 o'clock at night. And coming back, we came back and stopped at O'Hare again. And uh, there was more people who were there around noon, so it was, maybe it was the time of day, but I had never seen O'Hara that, that quiet. Mm -hmm. What do you got now? Um, I don't have any more. don't have any more. Yeah. Uh, you can do what you want. You can look at these pictures and see what you want, if you want any of them. And uh, other than that, I think I've said about everything I thought of. Like, Say, I hope it's something that you were interested in, something that you wanted, mm -hmm. and that we got what you want. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you. You're welcome. You're so anyway, I'm glad I tried to give it a chance. Give me a chance to think back at some of the things I did I hadn't thought of in years. And I, since the first telephone call, I've been trying to think of what I was going to say. But you got me going. <laughs> okay? Yes. All right.